good morning, everyone. Today I'm joined by Ricardo Ortiz, the chair of our Department of English, Associate Professor of US Latino Literature and Culture. And Ricardo, thank you for taking the time for this conversation. Now, you've been a part of our community for more than 20 years, and you've been an invaluable member of our faculty and an important presence in advancing a culture of belonging for so many of our students. Can you talk a little bit about these years and some of your journey and anything that you might be looking forward to in the time ahead? Sure, thank you, uh, uh, President DeJoya, for having me uh, participate in this great project that you've got going on. And um, I couldn't be more grateful or more honored to be a part of it. So thank you, thank you very much for this. Uh, you know, I'll start with the fact that uh, we are 13 years now in September of 2002, October of 2020 into October of 2020. Uh, it's the 13th anniversary of the Out for Change campaign. Um, and I think the first time I, I probably shook your hand uh, was on stage um, in ICC Auditorium when you held, held that historic town hall um, that really kind of launched the Out for Change campaign in response to uh, you know, the student activism that semester in response, you know, to, to the, the, the acts of violence that happened at the beginning of that fall. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I can't think of a more sort of pivotal and sort of anchoring moment in my own relationship to Georgetown and in the sort of transformation of my sense of belonging to Georgetown than to be able to share that stage with you and to uh, facilitate that conversation with that amazing group of, of people in that audience that filled ICC um, and then some. And so, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of that anniversary and, and think of all the other ways that, um, you know, I, I think for me, one of the things that's always been true about my relationship with Georgetown is that I can't sort of uh, think about it without, with, without going through a kind of identification with my students, right? That um, when I look at my students, I see myself as an undergraduate. I think about my own journey. I think about what those, you know, formative four years were like for me and what went right about them and what went wrong. And I'm always sort of trying to think about what else we could be doing as an institution to make it as, as positive and as supportive as, and as inclusive an experience for all of our students, regardless of their background, and regardless of what they bring with them to Georgetown. And so, you know, I can start with the LGBTQ initiative and the establishment of the center and all the great historic university-wide work that happened in 2007 and 2008 to make everything that's happened since possible. Um, and again, for the institution, for sure, but of course, for the students who are mo most directly affected by the work of that, of that movement, of that project, and that I you know, never take for granted and think is an ongoing daily miracle. And you know, clearly, that's in part due to the leadership of Shiva Subaraman and everyone else at the center, but it's also you know, due in large part to the sort of the institutional embrace that Georgetown has brought to it. But I, you know, in, in, in addition to LGBTQI students, I can also think about my identification with our first generation students, with our students from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds, um, our, our working class students, uh, our immigrant students who come from all these different sort of life experiences and bring that to Georgetown is in a sense part of what enriches our institution and our community's life. But that in a sense, we're always called on as an institution to sort of support um, as, as well and better um, as we can sort of uh, in, in, in this sort of ongoing yearly experience that we have with it. Thank you, thank you. And one of our earlier interviews this fall, uh, Kathy Olesko, the chair of our main campus executive faculty, our main campus faculty governing body, described an event that you had been a part of at the MCEF earlier this year that reflected on what our faculty are experiencing at this time as we spend time away from the traditional classroom setting. I was wondering if you could speak to some of the ideas and insights that were shared in those conversations. Sure, I'd love to. Um, so again, uh, Kathy Olesko, who's a really just a wonderful leader of our main campus executive faculty and a great colleague and somebody I consider a friend, um, had seen a, a, a post that I put on Facebook some weeks earlier, uh, you know, reflecting basically just a kind of moment that I had over the summer after my experience of moving to Zoom teaching in the spring um, and, and, and observing, you know, just watching what my colleagues were going through, going through um, the course design uh, institutes that Candles put together this summer. Um, I also started a teaching circle with some of my colleagues in the English department to sort of, you know, for those of us sort of of a certain age, you might uh, experience more difficulties or more challenges with the, uh, the, the technologies at our disposal to, to support our teaching. Um, and I just started to realize that uh, 
it, you know, it, this is, again, it's an unprecedented experience, but in the, in the way that we all moved out of our classrooms in the spring of 2020, um, made me realize how long I'd been in the classroom in the course of my life, right? That I, you know, starting as a student, we, my family immigrated from Cuba in 1966, and we landed in California in September of that year. And I immediately started, you know, elementary school and kindergarten. And I think about sort of like my American life, my life with the English language, my life um, as, as, a, as a member of this, you know, of, of this country and, and eventually a citizen, as in a sense really being anchored in the classroom. And that started with my experience as a student, but it's certainly translated into my, my experience as a teacher. And, uh, you know, I just, I started to realize that, um, you know, what I was feeling was a kind of grief. What I was feeling was kind of um, a version of, I think, what my parents felt when they, when they felt like they needed to leave Cuba because they couldn't live there any longer. And it felt like a kind of forced exile on them. That um, there's something about mourning a place that almost feels like a homeland, that feels like, you know, I like, I like to say I'm never more myself than I am in the classroom. Uh, and, and that's kind of true. Uh, and so to not be in it is, is, a, is, you know, makes me into a different person, makes me not able to be myself in ways that I really enjoy and, 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 and celebrate. And so, um, you know, Kathy saw that post and decided that we could do a whole sort of session of an MCF, um, one, of, one of these sort of more informal meetings around it. And she invited other colleagues from Georgetown to share their experiences as well. And, and again, it was just a really beautiful moment of, of community building where, you know, a, a number of us were able to share our very different sort of versions of, of that story that I just told. But I think where we could all sort of, for a moment, live in, in a way that, again, it's, it was fine to sort of take it for granted for as long as we did, but that, you know, we're just so honored and lucky and, and, and blessed to, um, to be able to enter a classroom where students bring what they bring to that space and where we share with them and try to sort of, you know, do what we can to, to help them, um, you know, uh, uh, grow and form and, 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 and flourish, uh, you know, and, and, and part of my message in, in my post was also that, you know, historically the classroom hasn't been equally kind or equally safe for every student that enters it. And that this is probably an opportunity too to think about the ways that we can improve on that legacy as well. But, um, but again, just as a moment of reflection and a moment of uh, kind of almost of discovery, right? Rediscovery of just like the special quality, the special nature, the special power um, uh, of, 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 of the classroom, right? Uh, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacred space because it's a common space. Um, and it's one that we need to, we need to take care of. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end this, this by just saying that I do find that there's a kind of alternative, but um, you know, comparable uh, intimacy and, and specialness that can happen even in the Zoom space that uh, I have found the way to make this work and make this live uh, for me so that I believe in it and I want to be in it too. But it's just different than, you know, when we're all sort of in the classroom together. Sure, sure, sure. Can you take it a little bit deeper? What do you see as the roles and responsibilities of the fa faculty in a community such as ours, particularly in this moment? How do faculty contribute to a culture of belonging within higher education? Um, well, I think that we're all being called on now in ways that I, I don't think we were as a kind of uh, uh, whole community. In, and again, it's just structural. It's because we were all just forced to leave campus and forced to think about our teaching in these different ways. Not that, not that Georgetown hasn't been sort of calling us to sort of do this thinking beforehand, but it's more a question of like now, well, we just all have to do it. Um, and I have found that um, my colleagues, at least you know, in, in the ways that I've been interacting with them um, online and in many, many settings across meetings, um, uh, sort of in, in the Georgetown framework, uh, have really risen to the occasion and that I think that we're all sort of in our own ways, um, realizing that we can't take for granted anything about the way that we conducted our teaching before, and that that's going to sort of change the way that we're mindful about how we conduct our teaching going forward. And I'm hopeful, I'm actually quite confident that for the vast majority of my colleagues, that's going to include um, a greater attentiveness, a greater um, sense of sensitivity around um, who each of our students is when uh, you know, when they walk into our classroom, when they come to our campus, um, and how it is that we can sort of use our teaching uh, in a way to, to meet them where they are. And from that point, from that, from that different point of contact, make them feel, help them feel, you know, inspire them to feel like they belong. 
um, that, you know, it's, it's been one of the, uh, again, one of the, the, the sadder qualities of this or the, or the challenges involved in everything that we're doing is that, you know, I look at our, our first year students who haven't had the, the, the you know, the privilege of, of being on our campus the way that we all sort of, you know, enjoy that and take it for granted when we watch our, our you know, first year students traditionally go through that experience. And so just to sort of find other ways to make them feel like Hoyas, um, to help them feel connected to, to Georgetown, but also to one another in ways that, um, you know, help us to build that sense of community and belonging. I think that uh, I, I have found in conversations with a lot of my colleagues across the board that we're all thinking about this 100% more than we were before. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you and your colleagues in our English department have been at the forefront of developing the idea of public humanities. Could you offer some reflections on this work and, and the work that you're engaged in now? Sure, yeah. Um, so there, there are a lot of different sort of ways in which this happens, and I'm certainly not the only one who's engaged in, in this work. I would say that my colleague Catherine Temple has been a leader in this, um, uh, in this work and somebody whose example I follow, and she's you know, established a new master's program at Georgetown and engaged in public humanities that we're hoping will have its first class this coming year. Um, so, you know, I think public humanities takes a lot of different forms and can, can sort of do a lot of different kinds of work. Uh, you know, part, partly I think it's been a, a shift in the way that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the disciplines of the humanities, so literary studies, cultural studies, philosophy, theology, art um, and art history, um, performing arts and, uh, and, and, and history, have been thinking about sort of you know, why, why we train our students as we do, why we offer them the kind of knowledge that we offer them, the sort of the opportunities for critical thinking and growth that we offer them. And that, uh, you know, in a way, uh, we don't, we, we're not doing it to sort of make them all into professors in our disciplines, right? We're making, we're doing this so that they can go out into the world and use their training, use their education to, um, to, to meaningfully sort of transform the way that the, the way that the world works, the way that the world proceeds to do to do whatever it does to try to sustain us as, as a species and as as a as a world. Um, at the same time, that I think for a lot of us, um, we we've been uh, you know interested in in making our work more visible to people other than our students and people other than our colleagues and our disciplines who read our work. And so the other place where this happens now is in all the sort of opportunities that we have, whether it's just in writing, whether it's in publishing outside of academic um, uh, presses, uh, you know, the academic circles. Um, but it also can, 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 can be about doing really proactive kinds of work in the world based on our training, based on, on our, our disciplinary sort of orientation. So one example I can give you from my own personal life is um, uh, about a decade ago, I was uh, approached by the um, Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute to do some uh, what they what they thought at the time would be a sort of cultural enrichment work with their populations of interns and fellows who they bring to DC to work either in congressional offices or in agencies uh, uh, and administrative spaces across the government. Um, and these are mostly like young Latinos who are either undergrads if they're interns or grad students or if they're fellows. And they come to sort of do mostly this sort of policy work, this governmental work. But they wanted somebody to come in and basically just give them um, some opportunities to think about their culture and their history and their, uh, you know, the, what brings them together is Latinos doing this work, right? And so for 10 years now, I've been able to meet with these, these young people and talk about poetry and talk about film and talk about, um, you know, even you know, philosophy and uh, whatever, whatever seems to be, whatever seems to work best depending on the moment that we're in this work together. Um, and they really appreciate it and they really respond. Like most of them weren't humanities majors uh, in college or grad school. So um, this, this is a, an opportunity for them to get a certain other kind of exposure, right, to uh, the life of the mind. And in a sense, also like a, a rigorous sense of the life of the heart that, that, you know, the creative arts can give you, especially in the way that humanists study them. So it's, the, you know, these opportunities I think are going to grow rather than uh, uh, you know, retract in the, in, in the future. And, and, you know, the current pandemic notwithstanding, I'm very hopeful that um, public humanities will continue, continue to be a kind of growing thing in the world from, uh, from, 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 from here on out. Thank you, thank you. Now, for many years, you've been involved in our Community Scholars Program, and our Community Scholars are among the first students 
to actually come to campus. This year, this meant that they were among the first students in our new class to begin their time at Georgetown in a virtual learning environment. Can you offer some reflections on the work of, of community scholars over the years and what this year was like? Sure. Um, so the Community Scholars Program is as close to a kind of home program I have at Georgetown that's outside of my department, right? That um, the first time I taught it was, my, was the summer after my first year here. I've taught in the program about six additional summers since then. I don't, I don't every summer, but I do as often as I can. And I didn't teach in it this past summer um, in 2020, but I, I, know, I know the CMEA and the scholars team, um, they're as much my family at Georgetown as anyone else. So I've been in touch with them and I've heard all about their experiences this year. And I think that you know, they did Georgetown proud. Um, this is a program that, you know, that, that celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Um, it's been around that long because it's been that successful for this long. It's grown, it's evolved. I think it's, it's, it does its job even better than it did uh, decades ago when I first got here. But um, no, this is, one of those, this is one of the places where, again, when I need to sort of be reminded of how my students um, uh, you know, are, are basically uh, you know, the inspiration behind everything that I do, um, that these are the students that I sort of identify with in a particular and special way, just because I, you know, I, I would have, I would have qualified to be in a community scholars program if Stanford had had one in, in the late 1970s, but they didn't. So when I look at, the, at what scholars does for our students, I think, God, I wish I'd had that experience. I just know how powerful a help, how powerful a support it is for them, right? Um, and so, you know, along the way, just because I've, I've taught in it as, as often as I have, I have just these generations of students that I get to know in the summer when they first come to the campus. Um, that relationship is special. It feels more familial. It just feels more like intimate in a way that um, carries through and that means you know, that you're going to know them if you teach them in the fall as well. And then if you, if you sort of stay in touch with them for the rest of their careers, or they show up in your classes after their first year, or sometimes they major in English, or sometimes they go into Latino studies, or, you know, these are all things that have happened growing out of the scholars program in the 22 years that I've been here. Um, but I, I, I'm as loyal to this program as I am to any other part of, of Georgetown. And um, it's, no, it's, it's a terrific, terrific program. Thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough for taking this time to be with us this morning. And in closing, let me just ask you, is there one message you'd like to leave with our community at, as we start this new academic year? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, at, a, at a meeting that we had some months back, I think it was really still in the spring when, when we were turning into this new reality, um, the dean of our college, Christopher Chalenza, um, you know, this was the meeting of, of, of college department chairs, um, in trying to make sense of this moment said, you know, history has found us. Um, and that felt to me like as, as good a way of sort of understanding the moment that we're in as any. And then I sort of, as I reflected on it, I realized, well, for a lot of us, you know, history found us at other points too, right? So my being born in a country that, that had just had a revolution and thinking about the way that um, that event sort of upended my family's life and, and sort of made their entire reality different than it was before. Um, I've, I've just been thinking about these moments and, you know, they happen to a lot of us in very different ways from a, from, from a lot of different angles. But the one that we're in together, the one that's happening right now to this collective, to this community, um, it just makes me wonder, you know, it makes me think that um, part of moving forward from here, part of learning what we're learning now to think about what we might do differently later, right? I, I kind of just, I, I, want, I want everyone to sort of keep an open mind, right? To s still see a kind of almost like a blank slate in that future after all of this is done, where maybe we can think really openly and radically and hopefully about what we can do, both to just improve on the things we already do really well, but do differently enough to be a kind of radically other thing that, um, that actually, you know, takes us forward in ways that we couldn't have imagined, and now maybe we should, because, because of the unprecedented nature of what we're in. This is an opportunity to really think about the thing that maybe we thought was impossible, yeah. and you. about how to make it possible. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for everything you do for our community and for joining us for this conversation today. Um, I'm grateful to Professor Ricardo Ortiz for sharing his insights with us today and for his leadership over these many, many years. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. 
take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya everywhere.